On my honor, I will try to serve God in my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. Welcome to this kind of serious episode of uh, Super Geek Documentary Hour. Um, kind of brought on by something not so serious. Um, let's go ahead and, and, and just kind of uh, give you a little background as to why I decided to go ahead and do this show. Um, so my boyfriend has been, because it's spooky season, been watching and or re-watching a lot of different horror films. He's been doing this every night. Um, he will like a uh, remote watch with a friend of his and they will watch whatever movie. Like sometimes they'll like they're, <laughs> they have this thing that it's like a two for Tuesday where they will watch two uh, movies in one night. And that's usually on Tuesday. Well, um, recently in this whole process, they started on October 1st. They've been going every night and they watch at least one movie. Like I said, sometimes, except on sometimes Tuesdays, uh, they watch two. Um, the other day they watched the first two Friday, the 13th movies. Um, if you're not familiar with Friday the 13th, that is the Jason movies, um, where, uh, the, the kid, uh, gets killed at camp, like dies, uh, from a horrible drowning accident at camp and, uh, then comes back and wreaks havoc and slashes and murders people, you know, crazy murders people, um, and it's all because of like a, a, a kid that, that um, the camp counselors were not paying attention and this kid drowned. Um, so he was watching that and, and usually they'll do it and they'll watch them like later in the evening. And um, it's going to seem weird, but like I was, he was doing it in our, in our bedroom and I was going to bed and, and like, I can usually sleep while he's watching whatever. Um, it's not difficult for me to sleep and he just keeps watching TV and like all that. But like for the first few minutes and, and even with these like horror movies where people are screaming, um, he's obviously very polite. He will turn the volume down for me. Um, even like turn the volume down, like turn on like um, uh, subtitles you know, like closed captioning and like, like subtitles. Um, but most of the time, like he'll keep the sound on, but it doesn't bother me. Like he'll turn it down and I will sleep like a baby while he's watching Friday the 13th. Um, and, and the only reason I don't watch, I, I haven't watched a lot of them with him because by the time I go to bed, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bed because I, I have to work in the morning and, but I do love watching films with him. And one of my, coincidentally, one of my favorite Jason films is not one that is usually very popular. Um, so feel free to make fun of me if you want to. My favorite is Chase and takes Manhattan. I know, I know, I know. Okay. But I was actually kind of like, you know, trying to drift off to sleep and everything on, on that night that he was watching Friday the 13th and the whole idea of the camp and, and like everything like that made me think of Girl Scouts and made me think of Girl Scout camp. And I remembered I had watched this documentary that we're talking about here previously on um, Hulu and I had watched it previously and um, 
God, like not long after it came out, um, which was in uh, 2022, I believe. Um, let me see if I got any information about that. Um, legacy. I have, I have a Wikipedia page here to give you guys a little bit of information. Yeah, May 24th, 2022 was um, released on Hulu. Uh, the four-part ABC news documentary series, Keeper of the Ashes, the Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders. Yeah, so I, I was like, you know, I want to do something that... You know, a lot of people during the spooky season, like Halloween time, that will talk about um, the creepy things, like creepy movies that they've watched, that kind of thing. And I got to tell you something, guys. I don't know about you, um, but I get more creeped out by this kind of stuff uh, than I would ever get creeped out by slasher movies. Now, slasher movies, truth be told, are some of my more favorite Um types of horror movies because it, it's kind of like the idea of like the spree killer, um, the serial killer, that kind of thing where like there's a lot more this actually exists in in the world kind of thing like Scream, the Scream franchise. Um, I really have taken to like I really loved um, the A24 uh, X and Maxine where it's like, this is, these are actual, like not actual, not true stories, but like they're, they're, these are things that could happen, you know, like somebody could go on a spree killing involving doing this. This is something that could actually happen. And to me, like horror movie based, like those are the, the ones that that freak me out the most and they also um i also enjoy watching the most but the problem is is like it's still it, it it doesn't freak me out a lot um the way true stories do like this one um so keep her the ashes um you know what how about i do this i'm gonna talk to you a little bit about Keeper of the Ashes, kind of start you off here, um, give you a little bit of a, a background of Keeper of the Ashes, and then tell you a little bit more background about the case. Um, because it's important to give that background about the case because it, it, it ties directly to why I find it to be so creepy and why the person that's kind of narrating and 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 going through all this um why they are affected so much by it so keeper of the ashes um like i already stated came out in may of 2022 this is a documentary that released um was produced by abc and released on hulu and it was a four-part documentary uh, so you can watch it on Hulu. Um, if you have just a basic Hulu account, you're gonna it's gonna get broken up by by some by some commercials, but it's not obsessive with the commercials. So if you can deal with a, a, a few commercials, you'll be fine. Um, it is like I, I don't want to say starring, but like um, it centers around the Camp Scott. Oklahoma State Girl Scout Murders. Now, if you are a fan of true crime, true crime documentary, true crime podcasts, all of those things, you have probably, if you're enough of a fan, I don't want to say enough of a fan, like if you have never heard of this before, you're not enough of a fan, but like if you, it, it feels like to me like a for the most part, if you've really put the time in, you know about the Girl Scout murders. Um, you know about the legend of the Girl Scout murders. At least that you know about. And how 
there's a lot of stories where people try to um, assume or or try to steal the the story um, where you'll go to an abandoned campsite and they'll be like, yeah, Girl Scouts got murdered here. And what really is just like, mm -hmm, about that sort of thing, uh uh-huh, is that you have an actual story from 1977, June 1977, of that happening. So Kristen Chenoweth, um, actress and singer, okay, um, fairly notably known for being one of the famous people to ever um, perform Glinda um, at uh, um, on uh, Wicked, uh, the Broadway musical Wicked, um, blonde, okay, like blonde, just you know one of the sweetest looking women alive that just looks like she is just, you know, really just sunshine walking. Okay. Um, (laughs) She is very talented. Let's just say that she's very talented. She is an actress and a singer and she is uh, Oklahoma born and raised. Okay. Um, And she actually, um, narrates this uh this whole documentary and insert is inserted in the documentary due to her personal experience related to the subject matter keeper of the ashes um refers to a concept of the there was always one girl elected to be the keeper of the ashes the person that keeps everything um, and the fire and, 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 and makes, you know, it's, it's a thing. It's a Girl Scout camp thing. Um, and she, she was eight years old in 1977. She was from that area, from that same town that these three girls were from. Um, and she was supposed to be on this camping trip, but she had gotten sick. And her mother said, no, no, you can't go on the camping trip and trip anymore because you're sick. And she was so bummed out about it. But then all the stuff happened. Now, all the stuff that happened, um, we'll get into that in a moment. But basically, this documentary series, um, Keeper of the Ashes, the Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders, we'll say the name again, we'll say the name quite frequently through the, throughout this. So get used to it. Cause I want to make sure that you're going to this one. Um, and, and, and whatever. Um, I think that there's a number of different podcasts, um, that I've heard that have covered this pretty well as well, because ever since I heard about it, I became like, like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta hear, I gotta learn more about this. I became very interested in becoming knowledgeable about what happened to these three girls. Um, And it's also kind of interesting, and we'll get into this, is that um, part four of this documentary gets into the idea of using DNA evidence testing that wasn't available in 1979 to possibly, allegedly, (laughs) kind of solve this thing. Um, So Kristen Chenoweth returns to the area where she grew up um, and she wants to do this program and she's talking and interviewing with people and all that that has to do with this case. So let me tell you um as much as i can um about the actual thing that happened and i'm going to you saw my little warning at the beginning of this video 
and I'm going to do it again. Um, I'm going to tell you that I think while these little girls, their story and what happened to them is worth documenting and talking about. Um, one, I, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in this video. It would be a very long video if I wanted to cover everything. And this is not the documentary. This is just me reacting to it. Um, I... I let's just go without saying here. This probably goes without saying. Um, I recommend watching the documentary because it is well done and really kind of just it's gonna get you. Like it's gonna get you. Let's talk about first why this affects me so much. Um, obviously. You saw my little presentation here in the beginning of the video. Um, I was a Girl Scout for many years. I got as far as to, I mean, I got as far up as to earn my silver award. Um, I got that far. And um, if you were a Girl Scout, you know what the silver award is. Um, but it's, it's, it's an honor. Um, and I ended up, you know, eventually not being an active Girl Scout anymore. But you literally say that Girl Scout promise thing, the on my honor, I will try thing. Um, every time y'all get together, you know, as Girl Scouts, it's, I, I was kind of joking around, like, I could be sick, losing my mind near death. And I could probably, I will probably still be able to say that um, from memory. I spent... Um, a good portion of my childhood every summer going to summer camp. Girl Scout, they called it residential camp where I'm from. And I went to a camp called Cap Camp, excuse me, <clears throat> Camp Tapawingo. Um, I'm from central Illinois. And if you're from central Illinois and you're a Girl Scout, that you were part of the Kickapoo Council, you know Camp Tapawingo. Uh, I mean, girls up to a certain point. I don't know how functional Camp Tapawingo is involving the Girl Scouts anymore. Um, like I said, it's been a lot of years. It's been a lot of time, a lot of water under that bridge. So... These camps, when I first heard about the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders, and I heard about how Camp Scott was set up, uh, that's where all this takes place. I had to tell you guys, to, I first heard it described, right? And when you're when you first hear it described it, it's like and you've been to one of these camps um in my case it was camp tapawingo um but when you first hear about these camps that these girls were at and then you think about your experience and your memories involving it and you're sitting there and you're like holy crap tastic pile of holy moly okay when they describe the campsite i just i just hearing it described and i later ended up going back and finding photos <laughs> and seeing the photos online and seeing the photos in this documentary well, I'll be damned 
if the accommodations for Cam Scott weren't very, very similar to Camp Tapawingo, um, in that you had different units and you had like, when you would arrive at camp, you would register, um, and you would be told, okay, this is the, the campsite your program is going to be at. So you would have the whole campgrounds, which was Tapawingo, right? And then you'd have the different units. And each unit had a cabin. Then the unit would also have probably a latrine or an indoor um, in-cabin uh, plumbing situation, okay? Um, so there would be the, the cabin, the latrine, like a little water area with sinks and everything where you could brush your teeth and, and stuff like that, wash your hands, that kind of thing. And then there'd be like a little campfire circle, right? And then there would be a bunch of platforms kind of in a semicircle near everything else, right? So then you'd have like a campsite and maybe the latrines are off to the side, right? But then you would have like the campsite, um, like the, the, the um, oh God, what's the word I'm looking for? The campfire uh, circle, the like sinks nearby, all that stuff. The latrines off to the side because nobody really wants to be near those, but you know, whatever. Um, And then you'd have all these little platforms. And on the platforms would be cots and a tent. The tent would be a big canvas army like tent. And you would have like little like weather, like rain flaps over the tent. You would have the tent and the flaps you could that you could roll up or roll down or, or what have you, depending on the need, if applicable, <laughs> okay? And it was just like a green or brown canvas tent. And each platform had that. And each platform had like three or four cots where each girl would go and pick out a cot and that's your cot and you have your stuff with you you have your sleeping bag all laid out and everything like that and fun camping adventure ensues okay um i i have to tell you like being in um around the age of 40 seeing this thing for the first time when it first premiered and i just rewatched it thinking back to my own experiences. Thankfully, nothing bad happened, but we were just kids. And, and the camp counselors were college kids, you know? And so like you'd have a few camp counselors, each unit, and they'd be responsible for like a number of girls and there was really not a lot between us and everything in the world. And we slept in those things. And I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, like, I, 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 I look at that and to me, like, I know some people might say, you know, well, you know, this is why all of our children are, are weak. Um, I look at that and I think, why the hell would anyone want to leave their child in the care of that. And I understand. And I, I, in that situation and the time and everything like that. And there were, there were camp counselors and, and you're leaving your child 
to be at this camp and and I guess maybe I did it all those years and nothing bad happened. So, um, okay. Okay. But people say that we baby our children. I, I know. I think maybe we grew up in a world where we recognize the evil that exists and we just want children to be protected from it. And I think that, that maybe there was an evil that existed that wasn't that recognizable to the world back then. I don't want to blame parents. I don't want to blame my parents. My parents thought that they were giving me a wonderful experience. And it's true, they were. Um... I'm not sure I would, you know, I'm not, I'm not a parent. I'm a childless cat lady, but you know, if I was, I don't think I would, I don't think I would be comfortable doing that. After hearing about what happened to these families and these three girls. Well, let's talk about them. Let's talk about them a bit. Let's say their names. Lori Lee Farmer, age eight. Michelle Heather Gouzet, age nine. And Doris Denise Milner, age 10. June 13th, 1977. At Camp Scott in Mays County, Oklahoma, United States, United States. Um, three Girl Scouts, and obviously I just read their ages between the ages of eight and ten. Um, they were found raped and murdered. Their bodies were then, I'm, I'm reading off of the, the Wikipedia, just FYI, if I'm not making eye contact, it's not because I can't face this, I can, but I am trying to make sure that I give you this information um, and I am accurate as to what I am seeing here. Um, their bodies were then left on a trail um, leading to the cab site showers about 150 yards from their tent. The case was classified as solved um, when Jean Leroy Hart, a local jail escapee with a history of violence and rape, we'll get into that later, was arrested. However, Hart was acquitted in March 1979 after a jury unanimously returned a verdict of not guilty. Uh, cause of death, homicide by strangulation, and technically because of the not guilty verdict it is classified as unsolved um there's a lot of different things that happened that's the 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 gist of what happened around that um please note that gene Leroy Hart, that bastard, asshole, um, allegedly, uh, <laughs> allegedly and convicted. You know what? I can say that. I can say that because of something I'm going to tell you guys later. He is an asshole, rapist, and alleged murderer. Let's do that. Um, so there's a lot more to everything that happened, um, before leading up to everything the day of, and then everything that happened afterwards. And like I said earlier, you cannot possibly 
get into all of that. Um, so this documentary, let's talk about the documentary specifically. Kristen Chenoweth, like I said, um, felt a absolute connection uh, to this case because of the circumstances surrounding it for her. She grew up in the same town of these three girls. She knew of some of them. Um, she was supposed to be at that camp and she ended up not being able to go because of, well, she was sick. And her mother said, well, you can't go if you're sick. Well, I mean, that makes sense. You know, can't, can't argue with that logic, right? So this is something that her and other people of the community have been very, um, it's like one of those things that you can't shake. You know, it's, it's, it's when you hear about it, you can't shake it. And, and, and I, this kind of how I feel about what happened is you hear about it and it's just, it's, there are certain things that make you think about it every so often. And you're just like, wow, that's crazy. There are other cases like that. Um, true crime, crime cases that I, I feel that way about. Another one that involves three victims would be um, the West Memphis Three case, um, where kind of like the reverse happens, where like you have these three children murdered and um, all that, right? Everything that happens. In that case, you have like three for all intents and purposes, wrongful, um, acute, um, uh, wrongful convictions, um, for Jesse, Miss Kelly, um, oh God, why am I, Jesse, Miss Kelly, um, Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin. Yes. I, I pulled that out without even having to look that up guys. Yeah. I'm for real. Okay. Um, so Jesse, Miss Kelly, Jason Baldwin, and uh, Damian Eccles were falsely, for all intents and purposes, accused and convicted of murder. Um, Jason Baldwin and Jesse, Miss Kelly were convicted and sent to jail for for life, for prison to prison for life. Um, Damian Eccles, believed to have been the ringleader, so to speak, was uh, tried and sentenced to death row. Now, several years later, um, DNA and other types of evidence that were admitted in case for appeal, um, got the state of Arkansas to offer an Alford plea to those three gentlemen. And so because of the Alford plea, and all the circumstances around it. If you don't know what an Alfred plea is, an Alfred plea basically, in a nutshell, is um, if you were convicted of something um, to prevent a retrial and that kind of thing and, and, and everything, you basically have to go in front of a judge um, state, you know, even though, um, they could probably still convict me, um, due to this new development, I maintain my innocence and I plead guilty based on maintaining my innocence and they let them go. Um, so there's way more nuance to it and that kind of thing than just that. But that is the gist of an Alfred plea. You are basically, you know, throwing the state a bone and saying, yeah, you might be able to still convict me, but I'm going to just be like, yeah, um, I'm pleading guilty, but maintaining my innocence. And here you go. And they let you walk out the door. Um, now, the reason why those guys took that is because they knew that they were innocent. And they were like, okay, well, we can't do anything. Um, one of us, they're trying to kill. So we're going to do this so that we can all walk free. 
um, whether they agreed with the concept of it or not. Now, the opposite kind of happens where you have, and, and in that case, you have this thing where it's like this um, witch hunt of these kids because they were goth. This is this is for the West Memphis Three uh, guys. So you have this kind of like witch hunt um, for these three kids. Um, and there's like nothing, there's like nothing attaching them to this case. So on this side with the Girl Scout murders, you have a number of suspects, but the main suspect that anyone really talks about is, um, is this, this dude, his name is uh, Jean Leroy Hart. Now, Jean Leroy Hart is a motherfucker, and we'll get to that more in a second. But this this documentary is, like I said before, set up in four different parts, giving context, history, um, reaction, and after action. Okay, so you have context and history reaction um and and everything and then you have the after action all of that um and it's covered in these four episodes now what was really interesting and and how they did this and how they set up this documentary is that you had like literally it was you you lead in with the beginning you you give uh, you're given the background um you're given what happened you're given what happened right afterwards you're given uh the reaction you're given um everything that that happened in like that moment right so like from June 13th, 1977 to like when, <laughs> when this dude is sitting in a prison yard and he collapses and dies. Okay. So the Gene Leroy Hart collapses and dies and you're given like three episodes that are like that, right? And then you get into the fourth episode, which is kind of like if you are, let's compare this case to the West Memphis Three. So if you're really, if you're weird and into true crime like I am, you've probably seen all three, not to discredit you if you haven't, but if you're like me, you may have seen all three of the Paradise Lost documentaries, which basically you, you have like these three different parts and these filmmakers, they got to know um, these three guys because of the, the whole process of they over years of time covered this whole case, right? And when you get to the point where it's, the third documentary like paradise lost, paradise lost three you're getting to the point where we've also we've gotten the the wrong the wrong situation we've gotten the wrong outcome now what are we able to do with what we have now to fix that or not necessarily fix it but what do we have access to that we didn't back then to do something now and for good or bad what what can be done um so you end up in throughout all of this getting introduced to a number of people you get introduced to um two of the girls parents um uh they do a lot of of interviews and 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 work talking to um, to Laura Lee Farmer's mom and dad, and um, also Doris Denise Milner's mother. Uh, you get a lot of their reactions and them thinking back to 
everything that happened and their viewpoint of everything, how they reacted to everything, like through the case, through after the case, everything. And you have a lot of interviews and, and discussions involving people that worked on the case back then and work on the case now. So you found like there was, you know, discussions involving um, the manhunt for Jean Leroy Hart. There was discussion involving um, the trial. Um, they did interviews with people that reported on the situation when it originally happened. Um, you have people that were interviewed that were camp counselors. Um, you have people that were interviewed that were original investigators. Um, you have people that were interviewed that are just people that do like research and studies on this stuff now. Um, all the way down to like most of the episodes are like there's this the sheriff of Mays County. Man, this guy. It, it's like. I'm like a cab, right? But like every once in a while you hear these stories about what you wish, what you wish police and investigators were like. And every once in a while you hear one and it doesn't change or help the fact that there's so much a cab. Um, but Every once in a while you find, you find one that people claim to exist that are the good ones. And this guy, this guy, right on, sir. Okay. Sheriff, Sheriff of Mace County, right on, sir. Okay. Cause he decided he was a little boy. He was like, he said in, his, in one of his interviews, in one of his portions, one of his segments, he was eight years old when this happened. When this originally happened, he was eight years old. And he, um, that stuck with him, just like it stuck with Kristen Chenoweth. And he decided when he became sheriff that after a meeting with uh, Lori Lee's parents, and he decided he was going to devote his cold case free time to figuring out what happened to these little girls. And so like you get to this point where you've got like the different parts where it's all built up. Like this is everything that happened like between girls going to camp and, and dude dropping dead in the prison yard after he was not convicted of the murder. So let's talk about, this seems like a, like a good time to, to really just kind of quick jump in to Jean, uh, to, to, to Jean here, to a waste of jeans. Um, Jean Leroy Hart, um, uh, about 15 years prior to the murder. Um, they talk about this. They give a little bit of background on Jean a waste of jeans. Um, and he was like a big deal in, in this, this little town that Scott, uh, Camp Scott was in. And he was, you know, star athlete. And then after high school, it all just kind of fell apart. He would play football and he was like a big deal. Everything just started kind of falling apart. Well, after a certain time period, he, it really just was not going well for Gene and Gene one night, this is totally separate from the Girl Scout murders. He kidnapped, took two, kidnapped two women took them to a forest area, raped, beaten, tied up, 
left for dead. These two women, they survived. And he had been convicted of rape, murder, tying up these women, kidnapping them, you know, attempted murder, that kind of thing. And this had happened a number of years prior. He um, was in police custody. He had been tried and convicted. He escaped from jail. And when the Girl Scout murders happened, he was currently still on the lam and believed to have been in the area. Now, they collect all this evidence, all this stuff happens, and there's the, the thought process through part of it where the, the film, um, that part kind of leads you to believe that maybe he had been wrongfully accused. Um, because there's some corruption in this whole circumstance. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know what? Here's the reason why a lot of people that should be convicted of shit um, end up going free. And I'm going to tell you right here, right now. And it's because people that are corrupt, trying to put people away that are corrupt. When that happens, something always goes wrong. See, the thing is, the people trying to put the people away that are shitheads, right? They need to not be shitheads themselves. Because with the burden of truth being on the prosecution to convict, even in a horrible case like this, if you cannot be trusted as the prosecutor then you're already up Shit's Creek involving this whole thing. So there's that. There's the the um, the idea that people thought that, that people of the Cherokee Nation were being mistreated, which I'm sure is very true. Um, and he was a member of the Cherokee Nation. And the fact that he was a football star... Hometown football star. Yeah, don't even come at me with that. Um, he was a hometown football star, and so everybody in his little town thought he couldn't have possibly done this. Granted, he was already tried, convicted, and escaped from jail involving raping and leaving uh, attempted murder of two women using techniques that involving the the uh the the situation with those two women using similar techniques that he used on these three girls allegedly <sighs> so even when he was acquitted of of murdering the three um, little baby girls, little, little girls. He still went back to jail where, uh, a few months later he was in a prison yard, um, exercise yard and he dropped it. Couldn't have happened to a better guy. Oh. <sighs> Anyway, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on that guy before I did anything else to kind of color stuff that I had said already in this program. And so we've got these, these moments leading up between, you know, the day the girls got on the bus to go to this, this campsite all the way up to Jean Hart dropping dead in a prison yard. This is like the first three parts of this documentary. And then... You get to the real nitty gritty in part quattro. Okay, part four is where we throw it all on the table. Yeah, you, you throw your cards down and you say, yeah, you, you ante up, 
you throw some more money into the circle to center the table and say, you know what? Show them. You got to know when to hold them and all that stuff. Okay. This is where, this is where it gets real. Like, obviously everything's real, but this is where it gets really, really real. It's already really real. You guys know what I'm trying to say. Okay. Like you don't need me to, you know, you know what I'm getting at here. So this is the episode where like Paradise Lost 3 with West Memphis 3 um, gets into the nitty gritty about using today's um, available research and technology <clears throat> to get answers. Which is what they do. It turns out that, you know, not only was C Christian Chenoweth um, affected lifelong um, because of everything that happened, there was another woman um, and she was affected um, by what happened to the point, and she was a classmate of one of the girls. And I think she might have also been at the camp too. Oh my gosh, so many people there. Oh my gosh. Imagine the survivor's guilt that these people have to go through. Um, so it affected her so much that eventually she went to work for the, um, God, what is the name of the thing? I gotta look this up. I am so sorry. Hold on. I want to make sure. Do, 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 do. Um... I do want to bring that up. I do want to keep that up. Um, the Centers for Missing and Exploited Children. The National Centers for Missing and Exploited Children. I just remember that. I didn't find it. I just remembered that. Um, she went to work for them, right? Because she was influenced by the story of Lori Farmer. And that's really cool because she worked with the sheriff and the Mays County um, and the good people of Mays County who coughed up the money to pay for all this testing. Um, so they originally did some DNA testing in 1989. The DNA testing in 1989 um, showed three of the five, um, and I'm just reading from the Wikipedia, showed three of the five probes matched Hart's DNA. Statistically, DNA from one in 7,700 Native Americans would obtain these results. So it narrowed it down to 7,700 people. Um, so this was not conclusive enough evidence, okay? <clears throat> like, forget what you believe based on what you hear about this case and everything like that. Besides the DNA evidence, it was not conclusive. Um in 2008, authorities conducted a new day and night testing on stains found on a pillowcase. The results, which proved inconclusive as well, um, because the samples were too deteriorated to obtain a DNA profile. Okay. In 2017, this is um, the the one that we're talking about, um, where you have the, the woman that works for the Centers for Missing and Exploited Children. She comes in and she's like, we're going to try and get this all together. She works with uh, these different labs and that kind of thing. She works with the sheriff and the, the sheriff, Mike, uh, I didn't mention his name yet. Sheriff Mike reads. Um, and they, in 2017, $30,000. Yeah. They raised $30,000 um, in donations were raised by the sheriff in order to do new DNA testing using the latest advances in testing. In 2022, authorities made public that DNA evidence strongly suggests Hart's involvement, Gene Leroy Hart, um, Sheriff Mike Reed of Mays County said, unless something new comes to light, something brought 
to light we are not aware of. I'm convinced we are sitting we are sitting I, where I'm, I'm convinced where I'm sitting of Hart's guilt and involvement in the case. Reed said that the results of the DNA test have been known to have been known since 2019, but he did not go public with the findings until asked to do so by the victim's families. Um, so I was watching something else um, not related to not talked about in the documentary, but they were saying for in order for these case to be officially solved um there's a number of people that have to agree on the findings um to my knowledge to this date that has not happened so the case is still unfortunately unsolved despite this evidence and this testing um some of the things that happened um that aren't that they don't get to discuss in this documentary. Um, some of the things that happen involving um, the legacy of these these three little girls. Um, a father, the father of one of the girls, um, went on to um, get the state legislature. Um, Richard um, 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 Guzay. Um, he helped get a Oklahoma Victims Bill of Rights passed. Um, he also founded the Oklahoma Crime Victims Compensation Board. Um, Sherry Farmer uh, founded the Oklahoma Chapter of Parents of Murdered Children, a support group. Um, as a result, the Supreme Court case McGirt versus Oklahoma in 2021, which determined that the crimes involving Cherokee, Cherokee natives on Cherokee lands in Oklahoma fell under tribal, rather, tribal rather than state sovereignty. New details about the killings are being investigated currently by the Cherokee Nation. So, yeah. So the 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 the, the case is still being worked on. Um, regardless of the DNA results. Um, yeah. So what is just, I don't know if like, I don't know what it is about about this case that is so interesting besides the fact that that um i mean you know plenty of girl scouts are out there that probably do not care um that aren't as interested in this as i am i think just something is in here <laughs> running around up in here that just is like ooh true crime Girl Scouts and um, Carrie, you know. And for some reason, my boyfriend one night watching Friday the 13th, part one, part two, influenced me to take another look at this one for you fine people watching this video right now with the super geek documentary hour. And I want to take a moment to one recommend this. You can find it on Hulu. Um, there's some other documentaries out there involving this, this case, but specifically uh, keeper of the ashes. Um, if you're into that sort of thing, you want more information, please seek that out. Like I said, it's on Hulu. Um, and really beautiful moment at the end where she has done a lot. Uh, Kristen Chenoweth has done a lot of like um, interviews of Laura Lee's mother and father. And she, at the end of it, she does like a little performance um, that's recorded of one of the songs from Wicked. Um <clears throat> Gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's the one where she's like, who knows if I've been changed for the better, but I know I've been changed for good. Um, I 
I would be lying if I were to say that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, feel a little emotion attached to that because my time as a Girl Scout, um, as a little girl was very formative to a lot of things about me and who I am. And just, it's so upsetting. These these three little girls, what and she says this in the in the film, like what could they have been? And they get torn down and in such a horrible way. And I don't know if any of these things that I do have, and even since starting this channel, have changed me for the better, but they have changed me. And the story definitely had a lasting effect on me to the point where uh, all my boyfriend has to do is watch Friday the 13th and and I'm reminded of the Girl Scout murders at Camp Scott and so um, I want to go ahead and this is a very serious episode obviously so I'm going to have to try to find something a little less serious um, for the next Super Geek documentary hour but What I'm going to do um, in the description below the video, my friend's uh, um, GoFundMe is still active. So please, if you are able, if you're able, please um, check that out. Um, and uh, if you're able, please help her out. Um, every little bit counts. Every little bit helps. Um, also, um, I'm going to see what I can do about um, putting a little um, uh, uh, link to information about the missing and exploited children people um, if you would like more information. Um, that seems right. I also, you know, I'm also going to find something um, in the description about I'm going to find, I'm gonna find some, uh, some information about um, there's, there's this, this issue involving women um, that go, women and girls um, that go missing um, from uh, indigenous tribes. And I'm going to also put information about them. Uh, even though the, the, ye, the little girls that were murdered were not indigenous Native American people, um, I think because of the involvement of the Cherokee Nation. I want to make sure that I use my platform for as small it is, as it is to draw some attention to them as well. Now, um, kept you for a little bit longer than an hour, but I hope it was worth it. Thank you so much for joining me today for Super Geek Documentary Hour. Keeper of the Ashes. And my name is Carrie Quinn. So that's all there really is to, to, to talk about at this point. So um, keep your eyes and ears open. If you see something, say something. And remember, the complacent never make a difference. So go out there and make a difference. 
Until next time, I'll be seeing ya.